you guys did a podcast and shared that he created 75 hard out of his own weight loss experience, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of like what he did to drop what over a hundred pounds. Yeah. And then through creating that and dropping that weight, I think his business and both of you guys, your businesses just skyrocketed. Could you talk yeah. to us about how that happened and why do you think health and wellness and how you treat your body interplays with our success in other areas of our lives? I think it boils down to one word, which is confidence. You know, when you're treating yourself right, you're moving your body, you're feeding it the good information by reading, expanding your mind, you're feeding it good nutrition. Your confidence grows because you're keeping these promises to yourself. Mm -hmm. And with every single day that passes that you do that, your confidence just soars. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. I'm Dr. Ashley, and I am so excited for today's episode because I have an amazing guest with us, Emily Frisella. Emily is a mission-driven entrepreneur starting her first brick and mortar business at the age of 20. She's the founder of the Paper and Plan Company, a three-time published best-selling author of Relationships First, People, Passion, and Profits, The Fresh Farmhouse Kitchen, and The Saint's Plate and The Sinner's Dinner Cookbooks. She's the founder of the Women's in Business Workshop, COO of 44-7 Media, COO of Arete Syndicate, co-founder of Freedom Reads Book Club, and she's a business coach and speaker. Emily's passion is helping others see what they are capable of and giving them the confidence to achieve their goals and live out their dreams. Let's welcome Emily Frisella to the show. Thank you so much, Emily, for being on the show. I've been so excited to have you. Oh, I thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would love to start off with you sharing a little bit about your health, diet, fitness transformation. I mean, have you always been so lean and so fit? No. So I kind of went in phases. I think a lot of people go in phases when it comes to like health and fitness. Cause you know, we go all in, it's like a season of life where we're like totally devoted to it. Then life gets busy and throws us a little like, you know, wrench in the plan. And then you kind of go off kilter a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I grew up kind of a chubby kid. I grew up on a farm where, you know, it was chicken fried steak, gravy, mashed potatoes, all that great, good, like Southern style food all the time. And, um, I realized, you know, I played sports. I was an athlete all my life. And I was played, you know, high competitive sports from seventh grade till college. And I played volleyball. So after volleyball ended, you know, you're used to training a couple hours a day. You could pretty much eat anything you wanted at that time because one, I was, you know, a teenager and, you know, it, your metabolism is different then. And then also I was being so active every day. Well, then after I, you know, volleyball was done, I was done with college. I started to gain some weight because I didn't change my eating habits. That wasn't a thing that I was taught when I was younger because it really health and nutrition. I feel back then, you know, back in like, you know, late nineties, early 2000, it was more about just women being skinny and, yeah. you know, almost like starvation diets or pills. And that was it. So all I knew how to do is like, well, I just need to eat less. I need to just like, and not in a healthy way. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. I almost need to like starve myself because I gained about 15 pounds um, a year after college. And I didn't like that. And so I was looking for healthy recipes, healthy renditions of the stuff that like my mom would cook us on the farm. And that's how I wrote my first cookbook because I couldn't find one that I love. So like, I'll just write my own that I can have good tasting stuff that, you know, is still healthy for me. So I had to do a lot of research on my own and figure out what works, how to count macros, what is actually a good food? Because a lot of people think if it doesn't come from a drive through it's healthy. That's not the yeah. case. You know, we have all of these prepared frozen meals and all this stuff. So I really went headfirst into all the health and nutrition space. I ended up general manager of a gym and I went to down in Texas and I had to get certified for exercise, uh, nutrition and physiology and kinesiology to be able to train at this place and also to teach the nutrition classes. So I learned a ton and through that, it completely turned my world upside down because, you know, at first, like anything, when you're going into a health and fitness journey, it's a little bit more daunting because there's so much misinformation. I mean, we see it everywhere. Every headline, it's take two of these pills and do this, drink this and do this, starve and do this, do cardio before this, do cardio after this. There's so much like crazy information out there. And really what it is, is let's move our bodies and let's eat less calories than what we burn a day. Pretty much, you know, those are the two maybe like key components. And I learned the importance of protein intake, which is huge. And I always tell people like, if you're struggling with anything, just make sure you're getting that protein in and your body will start to move the needle for you. So I really went all in on that, learned about this, and I started seeing results very quickly, which kept the momentum and kept me motivated to keep going. 
And then I was just all in. I started like lifting heavy weights. I don't do a lot of cardio. I will just go on a walk every day, but it's a pretty like you just mild walk. I'll do hit cardio about three times a week for five minutes, um, like true hit cardio on a treadmill where I'm doing sprints. And through that, it's become something that it's easier to maintain because at first it seems so grueling and daunting when you're in it because you're like, I'm counting all of this. I got to do this. And it's a little bit overwhelming, but it really does become a true lifestyle for you where now it's like, I don't have to track my food every day. I know about what I'm getting in. I know what I have to focus on for my protein. I know, okay, I got to have a shake in the morning, shake after I work out, you know, my meals, and then I'm hitting my protein goal, which is 145 grams a day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, it just, it becomes such a passion. I started helping other people with their fitness journeys as well. And, you know, kind of coaching them. I don't do that anymore, but it just, it lit a new fire in me. And I realized that through the health and wellness journey, my business is also skyrocketed because I was feeding myself better, both physically, mentally, emotionally, everything, moving my body. I felt better, had more energy. I could be a better person to my coaching clients, to my teams, to my husband, to everybody. So, you know, I think that the fitness and health component should be the foundation and building block for everybody in their life. Yeah, that's great. So when you dropped that weight, were you able to just keep it off or did a little bit come back? Did you have cycles of it or was it just a one and done thing for you? It it was kind of cyclical because like I'm saying, you know, the different seasons of, you know, life, I never gained the full 15 back. I'd go up and I've been up and down maybe like five pounds, but Mm -hmm. I weigh myself about once a week. And I make sure that I never am over the five pound mark because I feel like just working with people, what I found out about is the weight crept on. It didn't creep on. It doesn't come on overnight. So if I am, if I do a weekly weigh in just to make sure I'm pretty much on track, I go mainly like how my clothes feel. But since I work from home, we're in the fitness industry, I wear a lot of workout clothes, which are stretchy. So it's hard to use that as a gauge. You know, it's kind of Mm -hmm. like, you know, like doctors and nurses, they wear scrubs every day. So it's really hard to tell, you know, it's kind of the same thing. So, uh, you know, I always check in every week. I just, I do my measurements once a month and I check my weight once a week. And that's it. And then if I'm over that five pound mark or so, or when it, if it's getting close, I can usually pretty much manage within about a two pound range now, just because I just can stay consistent with them. Like, okay, you know what, Emily, just chill out on the dessert a little bit this next week and you'll be back to where you want to be. And mm-hmm. I found that's much easier than, you know, letting it kind of, okay, it's 10 pounds. Well, 10 pounds. Yeah, it's 10 pounds, but five pounds is less, you know, it's not as hard to lose five pounds as it is 10 pounds. So I just kind of try to keep a gauge on myself in a healthy way. Um, I don't weigh myself every day or anything like that. I used to be very obsessive with that. And I realized that was not good because sometimes as, you know, as a woman with, you know, your cycle changing, your hormones, did I splurge that day on something? Did I not eat enough that day? My weight was going up and down so much. I didn't have a good solid baseline because there were so many variables. So now that I put it back to once a week, I find it much more manageable and um, enjoyable, honestly, because I'm I'm not like focused on just that scale. Yeah, that's what I advise our clients at PhD to do once a week. Otherwise, it's just needless anxiety. We all have those normal fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And so why put that on yourself? So I was going to ask you, if you do see yourself creep up, what are the changes that you make? It's less dessert. Anything else that you do to get your body back down within that range? Yes. I use the dessert as like a joke. I really don't eat a whole lot of dessert, but my thing is, is what I'll do is if it's done something, it's like, maybe we ate out, you know, or got takeout like twice that week, you know, and maybe it's like, okay, there were more oils because we usually only get takeout from one place and it's like a steakhouse. So it's like a steak and potato and a vegetable, but maybe there's more oils or butters in it than I accounted for or something along those lines. But if I do feel like it's, you know, the weight like crept up a little bit, really all I do is I'll do uh, just one or two more sessions of hit cardio that week. And that's it. Because doing the hit cardio five minutes, I get on the treadmill, I walk for like three minutes usually, and then I'll jump off to the side rails, turn it up to a high speed of what I'll sprint at. I sprint for 20 seconds, and then I step on the side rails for 40 seconds and rest, then I jump back on, and I do that jump on and off for five cycles, and that's it. And that's something that I think just with getting my metabolism to a healthy point, um, because as I mentioned, like after college, I gained that weight, I was doing these starvation diets, doing diet pills, anything I could, it completely wrecked my metabolism where it was just, it was dead. It was dead. So it took me a year, about a year and two months to really get my metabolism to a healthy state again. So now I'll just add yeah, one or two more cardio sessions. And that's really all it takes. I don't obsess about it anymore. I know that I know what to do. It's just following that action. Or maybe I'll log, I'll start tracking my macros for two or three days. And then usually it's, it all works out. And I also ask myself, am I actually up in weight? Or did I not drink enough water, you know, because people always worry about water weight. 
Well, me drinking, I drink about a gallon and a half to two gallons every day. It's just a habit I've had for years. Wow. It's because I always tease it's like my emotional support water bottle. I uh -huh. always have one with me. You know, I went in the grocery store the other day and grabbed it on my car and took it with me in the in the store. Mm -hmm. So it's almost become a habit to drink water. And so I just make sure, did you get all your water in? Did you have something with, you know, a lot of sodium in it that maybe you're retaining water? So I ask myself these questions. And by doing the once a week weigh-ins, again, it's up two pounds. Okay, Emily, what did you eat this week? Did you get all your water in? You know, and I, I base it around more of my nutrition than just my workouts alone. What were the steps that you took to get your metabolism back up? I mean, that's what my PhD was on. It looked yeah. at energy metabolism and what happens when we chronically under eat and over exercise and you really yeah. can shut down your metabolism. Yeah. So tell me what, what were the steps that you feel you took that worked to get your metabolism back up to a healthy place? So I started to do, um, I'm sure your listeners are familiar with like reverse dieting. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, I, I started on a program where I was technically reverse dieting, where I was slowly adding in more and more calories to see, to gain, because of course I could just eat a ton and try to gain weight, you know what I mean? Or get my metabolism healthier to get it burning, but I had to do it in a very healthy, clean manner. So every week I would up my calories by about 200 calories because when I calculated out, I was eating 900 calories. Oh, that wow. Was it. it was terrible. Yeah. So I had to take baby steps and it was just slowly and progressing. And then if I gained too much weight one week, okay, then I'd have to taper it back to only a hundred calories. And it was a very long back and forth process. And I worked with a coach mm -hmm. with this on this because I knew my metabolism was completely wrecked. And this is going to sound so strange, but I'm sure a lot of your listeners can uh, relate to this. I remember when I knew my metabolism was healthy because I had eaten and I started like sweating, like I was getting hot already. I'm like, oh man, my fire's burning inside. It's working. Yeah. And I, I knew it sounded so silly, but I told Andy, I go, oh my gosh, I think I'm back to being healthy again. And it was just one of those little key, key factors. And then it was, you know, the, the metabolism is such a healthy, uh, such an important concept or idea to this because now I can eat more and not gain that weight like I used to mm -hmm. because my metabolism was absolutely trashed from eating 900 calories a day for a year and a half. You know, that's where it got really dangerous because I would eat something, I would eat 1200 calories and I'd be up in weight, you know, it was just, yeah. and looking back in hindsight, it's like, it was so terrible. And I wish I would have never worried about trying to get skinny fast and just starving myself that yep. taking this health, taking the healthy approach actually works. <laughs> I, I always wonder that with all of these peptides, some agglutide, all of these things that just make yeah. us want to eat less, what the aftermath is going to do once we get off of these medications, yeah. these drugs. I look at it like, um, you know, and this is no knock on it because I know it's helped a lot of people. I don't even know if it's yeah. still in business anymore, but I remember um, like Jenny Craig or those companies that give you your pre-portioned meals. Mm -hmm. The problem I've always had with those is they never teach you how to eat. They just mm -hmm. tell you what to eat. So therefore you have to either be a lifelong dieter on their program with their food, or you have to get the education piece in order to know how to portion your food, how to prepare it, you know, understanding that your drinks are also liquid calories and things like yeah. that. So I think that has always been the one downfall to those types of, um, you know, meal prep companies mm -hmm. is that they, they lack the education. Obviously, they don't want the education because otherwise they're going to lose a client. So I think it's, you know, it, it's teaching people that you can eat real food and can, you know, be healthy because now, I mean, I eat pretty normal. I do a macro based diet, but if I want to have pizza, I'll have two slices of pizza. I just count it. And then that's it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't have to be this huge daunting ta task. Yeah. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about the ins and outs and the food and what to eat, but I also think, and I know you agree that weight loss comes from behavior as well, the mental and emotional side of things. And mm -hmm. so Will you share with us a little bit about, you know, I know your, your husband, Andy, he's dropped a lot of weight together. You've created 75 hard. Will you share with me a little bit about his journey, your journey, helping him and creating this amazing program that has changed, uh, what thousands of lives probably millions. Yeah. It's got millions. about three, yeah, it has 3 billion hashtags right now. on. Okay. TikTok. Well, there it's, you go. <laughs> it's That's wild. Amazing. Yeah. It's, it's been great. Yeah. Um, so as far as with like, you know, that, helping him and everything. It's really just us holding each other accountable. Cause it's always, it's always easier when you have like an accountability partner, especially one that you live with. So mm -hmm. we would not, you know, we would, if somebody's like, if I'd be like, man, I really want pizza. And he's like, no, you know, let's stick to it. We'll wait till this day or whatever. And we don't do it in, um, in a, uh, Hey, that you're breaking the rules. If you do that type way. Cause I think a lot of people get that on their head. They're afraid to have that with their partner, but it's like, no, Hey, remember your goals. This is what we're doing. And, we do 75 hard together a lot 
because it helps keep us both accountable because, you know, I understand that if you have someone in your house that's eating pizza and French fries every day and you're trying to be healthier, it's harder in that regard. You know what I mean? As far as like, you know, the discipline. So yeah. with, with his weight loss, he's such a disciplined and just driven individual. He always has been that it's, it's, I mean, he just does that all like on his own, man. He's just out there, you know, kicking butt, doing his thing. He knows what he's got to do and he holds, holds tight to it. And so I think it's also, I see his changes and that inspires me to also change or vice versa as well. And so I think it's just a really good partnership we have as, you know, in general, but also like, I think with that regard is that we, we want to help each other grow and build, but also, and I don't know if this just comes with maybe age or what, but I noticed I'm 41, but I noticed when I was about 33 or 34, I stopped caring as much about the aesthetic look and more about the actual, how do I feel and how do I operate look? And by me shifting my mindset, I actually changed my body more as well because mm -hmm. my mind was healthier that surrounding the whole weight loss aesthetic type thing. And it was changing that of realizing like, how does my body respond to this? How do I feel? How do I operate? And now it's like, you know, I used to drink diet Coke and now I just will, I don't just drink water or like unsweet tea. I would just drink like one diet Coke a day. I would feel like garbage and people think diet Coke is healthy. I just felt weighed down. I felt bloated and blah. And I just felt like I was in a constant like fog almost. Mm -hmm. And so I've really taken cues from the food that I eat as to how I perform when I eat it. The other day, for instance, I was like craving something chocolate and I was at the checkout and I was like, man, cause I love coconut too. I was like, maybe I'll get an almond joy. But every time I eat it, it always kind of makes my stomach hurt a little bit. I feel a little blah. And I don't know if it's actually something my body reacting to it or if it's just because I don't really eat candy bars or, you know, food like that. And I picked it up and then I, I asked myself and I caught myself because I used to be a chronic dieter and I was actually proud of myself because I, I think it's the first time I actually realized it. I was like, but how is this going to actually make you feel after? And I knew like, it's not going to make me feel good after. And then I also related to with our teams and our companies, you know, collectively we own 11 different companies and operate those. And I know that I can't be the best version of myself if I'm not feeling great, you know? So I need to be able to perform for my teams. I need to, you know, shoot content. So I need to be like, you know, sharp minded and, you know, happy and everything. And mm -hmm. so it's realizing how certain foods attribute to your mood and your feeling and realizing, do I really want to feel that? And, you know, most of the time it's no, sometimes it's like, yeah, because I really want that, you know, which is okay too. It's like, you know, yeah. if you have that in moderation, but it's just, I think it's understanding the connection to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. I always say that, you know, it's recognizing the foods that you say you love that don't love you back and yes. saying no to certain foods is actually a form of self-respect. What you did there was respectful to yourself. It wasn't mm -hmm. deprivation. It wasn't restriction. So it really is about changing the mindset around why we do say no or yes to certain foods. Don't you think? I think where that came a lot from was 75 hard, you know, cause Andy created that program in 2019. Mm -hmm. And for those listeners that aren't aware of it, it's 75 hard, which is part of a live hard program because there's actually like four phases to it, but 75 hard, it's 75 days without cheat meal or alcohol. You take a picture every day, you read 10 pages of a book, you know, and you work out twice a day and they have to be three hours apart. And one has to be outside regardless of the weather, you know, like obviously using your mind, if there's a tornado, don't walk in the tornado, wait till it passes type situation. And you do this consecutively for 75 days. And I realized back in 2019, cause I had never dieted for 75 days straight with no cheat meal. I used to subscribe to the idea of you diet all week. And then on Sunday, you'd have a cheat day, have bar food, and then we'll have a dessert or ice cream, whatever. And then I'd feel like crap for like two or three days after. And then it was terrible. I was undoing all the progress I made each week. And by doing 75 hard, that I think is the first time that I really realized how good my body was designed to feel by not having cheat meal, by not drinking. And actually, you know, we used to go out, you know, maybe twice a week and have a cocktail and have dinner mm -hmm. and things. But after doing the program, I mean, I don't even drink anymore, except maybe twice a year. And that's it because it's, you don't even crave it anymore. Cause you realize it's not doing me any good. You know, I don't feel good after it's not worth it. I can have just as much fun, you know, without it. And it just really changed my perspective on that and realized like, okay, my body is designed to feel really good. And by me feeding it garbage, I'm doing myself a disservice. Yeah. I remember Andy saying that you guys did a podcast and shared that he created 75 hard out of his own weight loss experience, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of like what he did to drop what over a hundred pounds. Yeah. And then through creating that and dropping that weight, I think his business and both of you guys, your businesses just skyrocketed. Could you talk yeah. to us about how that happened and why do you think health and wellness and how you treat your body 
interplays with our success in other areas of our lives. I think it boils down to one word, which is confidence. You know, when you're treating yourself right, you're moving your body, you're feeding it the good information by reading, expanding your mind, you're feeding it good nutrition, your confidence grows because you're keeping these promises to yourself. Mm -hmm. And with every single day that passes that you do that, your confidence just soars. Then what happens is people around you and your teams, they see that you're changing and your confidence, they want in on that as well. They get excited. They do the program or they just get like, you know, a fire under them because they see it and they're excited to push on and do new projects and things like that. So it's almost like a trickle down effect. Like you're the one that's like throwing the rock in the pond and all the ripples come out. And then when you're feeling that you're able to perform better in every aspect. And then naturally, you know, you're going to ride, you know, make that tide rise to succeed more, you know, and I, that's what we always say. It's like, I think when Andy started his fitness journey, it was 2016 and he had dropped 110 pounds mm -hmm. and maintained that and been able to keep that off and even getting leaner. And it's crazy because, you know, as we age, they always think, oh, well, you know, that's when you just kind of quote, give up on life and you just accept it. But it's actually the opposite. We look back on old pictures of us and we're like, we look terrible because you could tell we were like drinking, you know, kind of like the bloated face, look dehydrated and things like that. And we're like, man, like, thank God we took control of our health because I feel like we look better and perform better now than we did 10 years ago because we just live in that YOLO lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's great. And you guys have such a busy lifestyle. I know we were talking about how you feel like you're on overdrive right now. And I was saying, yeah. I can't imagine what that is for you because you're always on the yeah. go. So will you share with us a little bit how you plan for your busy life, how you balance it? Um, how do you and Andy manage it, especially with his role at First Form, your 11 companies, all of your yeah. stuff? Tell me how you plan for a hectic week. And then I'd love for you to provide some guidance on all of those who have insane lifestyles and say, maybe I just feel like I can't make this change. I can't drop the weight because I'm so busy. Yeah. So I treat fitness as an appointment every day. So it will be something, you know, where I book when I'm going to work out, I schedule that. And the way that I do that is I like, you know, they always say in business, you know, like, oh, you got to pay yourself first. Yeah. I pay myself first with my fitness. So when I sit down on Sundays, every Sunday is my planning period. It only takes me about 30 minutes to do. And what I do is I actually have like a weekly and a daily planner that I use. And I use the weekly planner. I carry it with me because it has everything I'm doing. The daily planner, I keep at my desk. So it's got like down to the nitty gritty of the hour, you know, like other tasks I have to do, my priorities that day. And I use those two together. But what I do is I have a priorities, needs, and wants method that I've been doing forever. And what I do is on Sundays, I write down on a notepad that I have, and I write down what my priorities are that week. These are things that are non-negotiables. These are meetings. These are, you know, appointments. There are anything that you cannot change. So I write down all my priorities. I log those in for my week. Then I write down all the needs, everything that I need to do that week. I write all those down. And then the last column is once everything that I want to do. And that could be, I want to go get a manicure or something, or I want to, you know, shop online for a new couch, just like random, whatever little stuff that's not a yeah. pressing priority. And I take all of those. So I plan on my priorities. Then I go through my needs. Okay. Where do I have time in this week to get my needs met? So that I'll put those in. And then if I can't get them all done that week, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to save these two for next week. So I'll do those next week. And as far as my wants, if I don't have any space in my calendar for it that week, those get pushed off as well. But I only allow it to be pushed off one week. So you can't have this rolling long list of things because yeah. everything technically needs to get done, but it's just prioritizing in the order that it needs to get done to move the needle forward. For me, that looks like what do I need to do to move the needle forward in our business to either, you know, get the rest of the projects to my team, approve something, get something to print or, you know, anything like that. So I map all of this out. And then I keep a paper planner for my team, for our media company. I keep a digital calendar because it's all guys and everybody needs to be in the know on like mm -hmm. the second it happens. So I plan all that out. I have a private team calendar for everything that's happening with my employees, what they're doing. And then I have a main calendar that I keep for Andy. So I plan his weeks out as well as things come up and also leaving wiggle room in there for when he has things, you know, because he still runs first form and runs supplement superstores and other things, you know, Arte Syndicate, all those things. So I keep wiggle room for those. So I usually only try to plan two things that I need for our media company each day because his days are just completely slammed. But I always try to make sure that I get when he's going to be recording, when we have a guest in, all of those things planned out. And it's not over committing yourself. I used to believe that having a full planner schedule meant that I was successful or doing yeah. well. 
and it's not. I just became completely run down. And about five years ago, I had this like revelation, like, wait a second, I can be just as efficient and not have a completely packed calendar. You know, as well as I do, it's like, you have to have time for those things that pop up throughout the day. I always keep about an hour and a half free in my day because every single day that time block gets used. I jump from my paper and plan company, from potty mouth papers to HQ to first form to RTA. I have to bebop around a lot during the day. So I allow drive time in there, all these little things like that, just because I know if I, I would rather be overprepared for it and feel better about my day than not know what's really going on or unaccounted time. And then it ends up, I'm running over in my day, but I also need to do emails. That's why I usually email people late at night because I do that from my couch or while I'm cooking dinner to try to keep up on emails. You know, there's not a one way fits all, but I just like to make a list of everything. Like I said, the priorities, needs and wants, I put those into a planner or if you use a digital calendar, you can do that too. And then I feel like, okay, I know everything is handled this week and I can enter my week on Monday morning knowing that things have been accounted for because I'm someone that I need to see that visual layout to know that I'm okay. Otherwise I'm like, what's going on today? You know what I mean? You kind of think like, mm -hmm. did I plan everything? Do I have it all in there? And so Sundays give me that peace of mind. It's a very small investment of time to be able to feel that good on a Monday morning. How long does it take you on Sunday to do all that work? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Because you're an mm -hmm. expert and you own I think that's what, and yeah, and I, company. <laughs> yeah. I, when I used to do it, it would kind of take me a little bit longer because mm -hmm. I was trying to juggle all the things. But mm -hmm. now I think it's almost kind of like a well-oiled machine where I'm like, okay, I right. only do this on these days and I only do this on this days. Yeah. So at first it was a little bit crazy, but it's much better now. <laughs> So then you put your priorities just to repeat back. Your priority is your workout. Like your workout isn't on the need group. It no, is actually it is priority. the priority. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I make sure, and I used to try to do it every day in the morning and then I would try to do it in the evenings, but I found out now I have to be a little bit more flexible with it. As long as I can get it done, then I'm happy. And I also take into account when do I actually feel my best because I don't feel my strongest or my best in the morning. And I used to do it in the morning just to knock it out, but I mm -hmm. found I actually get better workouts around three to 4 PM ish or, you know, three to five, because I think it's because I've had a meal. I feel that energy. I feel good. A lot of my day is kind of, you know, behind me. I'm kind of in the middle of my work day. And it's a, a way for me to take a mental break from work to try to like refresh my body and feel good. And then I can go back into work later. And that's also why I book any like zoom calls or meetings before my workout. Cause then after I work out, I can look like a total drowned rat and not have to see anybody the rest of the day. So it's things like that. I know it sounds so silly, but it's scheduling things like that, you know, cause then after, you know, we get done with the podcast here, I'm going to go do something else. And then I'm going to work out because it's like, okay, all of my visual meetings are done for the day. <laughs> And I do that too, but I find myself occasionally working through my workout. And I know that a lot of busy moms will say, well, I got to do this thing for my kid and it's taking mm -hmm. my workout time. So how do you make sure, I guess it's just a priority. It's a commitment that you make sure you get that in during the day and don't let anything else for anyone else impede. Yeah. And you have to have a little bit of grace with yourself with that. Cause there mm -hmm. has been days where, you know, it just goes to like hell in a handbasket and I have to just like. I have to either, I'll like miss my workout that day because there's, you know, too many other things come up that I have to handle. I try to be really intentional with my workouts because I used to, you know, be on my phone a lot. I take a yes. rest period between two to three minutes mm -hmm. and I would start, I'm like, okay, I would try to use that efficiently and do emails. I'm like, oh shoot, it's been <laughs> seven minutes already, you know? And it's like the time yes. gets away from you because the biggest time suck is your phone. And so I really try to be intentional where I will leave my phone you know, over on a bench or somewhere else. Cause I work out at home. I'll just turn on like our speakers in our gym. And I listen to that and I try to stay off my phone. That's it. And mm -hmm. because I feel like I have a way better workout and I'm able to get in the right mindset. I think about things more in depth. I'm able to focus on the mind and muscle. You know, I think it's more enjoyable because otherwise I feel like I'm almost rushing through my workout just to get it done because I feel like there's all this work waiting for me on my phone when I'm trying to do emails between yeah. sets. What about meal planning? Do you incorporate that into your week as well? Or do you feel like that's now just habit and a part of your routine? You don't have to it is, do Yeah, that. right now I used to all the time. I would always pick a day. Um, and the easiest way for me to, to do that, you know, with busy schedule is crock pot meals. I love crock pot mm -hmm. chicken meals because it keeps it really tender and moist. It's delicious. So I usually kind of rotate the same like three to four crock pot meals because I can just throw the chicken in there, do what I need to do to it. And then like at night when I get home from work, I can portion it out and I'm done. So I just, now I just kind of like, it just is natural to me now where it's like, oh, I'll just throw this in tonight before bed and I'll portion it out in the morning when it's done type thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the meal prep is 
massive and I don't even eat it every single day. I just like to have some meals on the go because that was my biggest thing that I found is like, I'm not hungry a lot during the day because I'm sure you know this. So it's like when you're, when you get busy and you're doing something, it's not that you're not hungry. You just don't even listen to the cues that you're hungry because you're so busy just trying to do your daily stuff. And then you sit yeah. down and you're like, wait, it's four o'clock and I haven't eaten anything today except my shake this morning. So having those meals on hand is perfect for that because sometimes when I'm hungry, I'll always just go and grab one of those and heat it up because you know they're portioned out, they're already ready to go. It's not, oh, well, let me find a snack because then we end up going to just whatever's available yeah. and just eating just to eat. Well, and then we don't end up feeling satisfied. So it's like, again, it's like me having those meals ready. I can get my protein. It's a great meal. You know, it's not going to throw me off kilter. And then I can just go on with my day. Does Andy do that as well? I think it's, you know, it's one thing to drop 15, 20, 30 pounds. And it's another yeah. thing to drop 100 plus pounds. Yeah. And we have clients who, who do this every day and make major transformations. I feel like it takes a little bit more time to ingrain different habits and behaviors with the more excess fat weight that you've lost just because it's been a part of your life for usually a longer period of time. Right. So do you feel like Andy's really on top of it? Does he bring meals in with, because how many hours a day do you guys work? A lot. <laughs> I don't a even lot. know. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't even know, but we like, you know, and that's the thing I also would like to say this too. There's a caveat too. It's like, we don't have children. So I don't want anyone to hear this to think that like, you know, like, Oh, I can do this too. Cause you know, we don't have the children that way you have sporting events or anything like that. So like right. work is our passion. We truly enjoy what we do. It's never feeling like it's a grind. It's just, mm -hmm. it's almost like a hobby for us as well. But you know, for him, I meal prepped for him whenever he was dropping his big weight loss um, yeah. and he was eating, you know, we used to do words you're eating, you know, three hours a day, you know, every day type thing. Mm -hmm. And he would take meals to work. But as he dropped that weight, he really, um, he prefers fasting just because his day is so busy. He doesn't have time to sit down and eat a meal. So he always has like a post-workout shake when he drinks uh, or when he works out at the gym, he'll drink one of those because we have a smoothie bar there. So he has, he gets a lot of protein in with that. And then I'll make him a meal when he gets home from work. And then we'll eat another meal, high protein, yeah. but a little lighter. So that way he's able to get all his calories in for the day and all his protein in for the day. Um, but yes, I used to meal prep for him. He would take it to work. And then once he got over that big you know, weight loss, that's when it would just adjust it a little bit and he feels better and he can perform better fasted. Yeah. I think men do really well with that more yeah. mental clarity focus. It's just their mm -hmm. body loves to burn fat for fuel women too, I, but men. Yeah. I, like, I feel like I couldn't fast like that. Like I just need something. Right. Otherwise I just feel so tired and groggy and yeah. you know, brain foggy. Brain sometimes. Fog. I was just, yes, totally. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so will you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to become an entrepreneur? Sure. My dad was an entrepreneur my entire life. He owned trucking companies and brokerage firms um, mm -hmm. since I was born. And I always, I saw that lifestyle of what entrepreneurship brought. And I'm not saying like material things. I'm seeing that, you know, the things that, you know, he was able to, well, I guess it is kind of start kind of material things, but not tangible. Like we could, we were able to be in club sports, you know what I mean? We were mm -hmm. able to, you know, have you know nice clothes we weren't we weren't like wealthy by any means but we were like upper upper middle class family and i saw that you know my dad was able to work and i liked that he was the boss you know and i liked that and um so it really inspired me because i saw like okay my dad can do this and if he needs to take off work to do because he was a full-time farmer as well so oh if he gosh. needed to take off work for that yeah he farmed about a thousand acres my parent i grew up on a farm and uh did row crop and cattle and then, yeah, his office was an hour and 20 minutes one way. So he would get up in the morning, feed the cows, check the cows, drive an hour and 20 minutes to his office, work all day, drive an hour and 20 minutes home. My mom would have dinner on the table. He'd eat dinner. He'd go to the farm, feed the cows again, check on them, do any farm work and come home about, you know, nine or 10 o'clock and sleep in the morning and do it all over again. And I liked that. And I, that's all I ever saw was a man that was working very hard to provide for his family. And we were able to have nice things due to that. But I also saw the freedom that it provided my mom as well to be a stay-at-home mom, to raise us kids. I was very inspired by that. So at 14 years old, I knew I wanted to own a house and own a business. So I started working two jobs and I saved all of my money because again, with my dad being an entrepreneur, we were very fortunate that um, they took care of our college and our, you know, paid for our vehicles that we had. So I was able to save all of my money. Mm -hmm. And at 19, I bought my first house. And then at 20, I bought my first building and property and land and uh, made it into a luxury gift shop, 
flower shop, tuxedo rentals. I did wedding rentals, the whole shebang. And uh, I just, I love that. And I had that for a few years and then I sold it, got a job in St. Louis, ended up moving to St. Louis because I met Andy at the job that I took. And you know, the rest is history. I went, I worked in a career for about six years that I loved. And then I decided to write my first cookbook. And that was taking a lot more time with working full time. Mm -hmm. So Andy and I had a conversation um, in 2014 that, you know, to, we were married at that time, a few years. And he's like, what if you just, you know, quit there and you go get your book done? And I was like, well, are you sure? And we talked about it for about two weeks. Then I decided and I gave my boss a uh, 60 days notice. And then I quit and started to write my book and wrote three books now and, you know, wow. these businesses and all that jazz. So I just, I was always inspired by my dad. He's just like super hard worker. My mom was so supportive of him. And I just, I love that lifestyle. That's where you got your work ethic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. My so mom then, always said the worst thing was like headlights on tractors because my dad is a workaholic. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I hear your guys' schedule, I'm thinking, hmm, but mine is similar and I love it. Yeah, it's just so that's fun. Thing is, I know it is. Yeah. People be like, oh, yeah. you're so busy. But I'm like, but you are too. It's just relative in different spaces because we don't see each other's day-to-day -day schedule. It's right. just, you know, it's, it's finding that time. And yeah. I think a struggle that I'm facing now that I think a lot of entrepreneurs face is the inputs versus outputs. Um, you know, there's a lot more inputs than you can handle outputs in a day. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to, you know, take ownership of that and realizing like, you know what, I can't get back to everybody every single day at the time. You know, there's, yeah. there's too many ways to contact people now through email, <laughs> DMs, Facebook messenger. There's, you know, all the apps out there, you can call them, you can text them, all this stuff. But I think it's also, it's understanding that, you know, like nothing, the world is not going to burn down if I can't get back to everybody. Because I used to completely stress and I would stay up till three in the morning trying to get back to every response of like emails, DMs, everything. And I realized I am only one person. I can't handle this. So I think it's, you know, it's also learning to schedule that as well. That's why I try to do emails for about an hour every night and just knock out as many as I can. The ones that are like hyper pressing. And if I have a little bit more time on the other ones, I don't get to them right away. Um, so I think it's also trying to manage that as well, because that is part of like your emotional and mental health is that. Yeah, you know, so much. Yeah. yeah. And even when you don't get back to them, I, for me, they're like open circuits in my brain and I, they just keep circling back. Like they're, they're open files and I need to shut those files. So it's, it is learning how to deal with just things that are still open and not finalized yes. or completed that's and such, that, that's, that's okay. It. No, that's such a great way to describe it because that's how I like, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, Oh, you know what? We should actually do this with this project and blah, blah. And I'll like yeah. email my team. I'm like, why did you email me at 246? I'm like, because mm -hmm. I just woke up and I was thinking about it. Because like you're saying, these open tabs that you need to close down. Yeah, so true. So then throughout these years of trial and error and learning and growth and creating amazing work, what would you say is the greatest failure that has resulted in uh, being a huge gift? Okay. So that's very easy. It's when I had my first business, I actually wrote about it in my leadership book. It's whenever I had my first business, I was 20 years old. I, I was, mm -hmm. it was, I just turned 20 two months before this and I had my business and I thought I was like, you know, hot stuff. Cause I like here, I'm 20 years old. I own my own house, own my own brick and mortar business. You know, I've got customers coming in. I got all this fancy inventory, all this stuff. But my dad, and my dad was successful in his career. And I thought that was like, going to be genetic. I thought I was just going to inherit that. Mm -hmm. It's in my DNA to be successful. And I, I was like too proud to ask for help, but I didn't understand anything about business. You know, you go to school, you go to college for business. That doesn't teach you actually anything in business. It teaches you how to read a PL statement and that's it. There's no real world things uh, in college. And that's what I learned. I was being taught by a business, a professor in business and marketing who had never known a business and did no marketing. They're reading it from a textbook. So I knew honestly nothing. And I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of financial mistakes. This is back before there was online banking or anything. And I didn't open my bank statements for like four months because like, I don't have time to balance my checkbook. I'll deal with this later, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I had the QuickBooks software at the time and it wasn't connected online because that wasn't a thing then. And I overspent money. I didn't understand vendor terms, you know, like, oh, cool. I got 30 days to pay this person. But I was ordering all this stuff from all these vendors because I wanted to have this big fancy showroom of stuff, not realizing, you know, I was being ridiculous because all those bills are going to come due in 30 days. And this is my slow season, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just made a lot of errors like that. And the, 
biggest mistake, but that ended up being the best blessing is I had one of my employees, I had six full-time employees at my shop and I had one of them come to me and she pulled me aside to the corner of one of our workrooms. She's like, Emily, and she's holding her paycheck. And it was on, I paid him on Friday and she came up to me on Monday. She's like, the bank won't cash my check. I go, what do you mean? She said, she said, goes, they said there's no money in there. Cause she banked at the same bank I had my business account at. Mm -hmm. And I go, what? She goes, yeah, they said there's no money. Well, online or on my computer accounting program, it showed I did. Well, I go, well, there's gotta be a mistake. So I took the check from her and you know that feeling when you know something's wrong and you get real hot, that like hot sensation, yeah. that's what I felt. So I was like, okay, I know this is weird, but whatever, let's go check it out. Cause I know, I know I have money. I was so sure of it. So I take the check up to the bank and the teller, she's like, yeah, there's, we can't cash it. There's no, there's not insufficient funds. I said, what do you mean? And she turned the screen around because I owned a business in a small town. There were people behind me. She didn't want them to hear. And the, it said $42 and 86 cents. Oh, no. And I was like, I, my stomach, it just dropped. And like, I was just like, what? I go, what? I go, that can't be right. And she was like, yeah. I go, can you print those out for me? She's like, did you not get your statements? I said, and I was like, yeah. And I was like, I felt so stupid. I was like, but I didn't have time to do it. So I just ignored them. So anyway, I realized, well, I've got five other employees outside of her and these other checks that I've written to vendors that are going to bounce. So I drove home, which was only about two miles. So it was, luckily it was super close. I got my savings account, withdrew money, put it in my business account. And I didn't have a whole lot of money at that time either. So I like, I pulled out a lot of money to cover all these checks, cover payroll, get myself a little cushion in the bank uh, to cover the business. And so I paid my employees cash for like two weeks and I lied and I said, the bank messed something up. We're working it out. So until then I got to pay you cash, which I really wish I just would have been honest. But at that time I was 20 years old. I was young and dumb. They were all in their thirties and forties. I didn't want them to think that this was not going to be a good place for them to work because the owner can't manage finances or think I was just some young, dumb kid, which I was, but I didn't want them to think I was. So I lied to them. And then the worst part of that was, is that now I had to try to, I had to hustle my butt off to get more funds in the bank without telling them why I was doing all of this, because they didn't know the financial trouble that I was in trying to get, you know, keep the business afloat. So I had hair of almost down to my butt at that time. And I cut it all off for locks of love. I would love to say that I was just being generous and charitable, but I was not. I did it because our, our small town had a newspaper and it got distributed to six surrounding little small towns. And my flower shop delivered to all of them. So I was doing it for free advertising because I made the front page of our local paper. That's how small the town is that my haircut made the front page. There's a picture of me holding this long braid and then I cut all my hair off and I would take dead flowers from our dumpster, put them in foam, use some hot glue and like rub it on like foam, like blocks and make it look stringy like spider webs. And I would string it around these dead flowers, tie a balloon on it. And we call them dead bouquets. And we sold them for people's like 30th, 40th, 50th birthdays. People bought so much of my trash. It's wild. And then I would like take flowers that I couldn't really sell anymore because only had maybe three or four days left. They're going to live. I would take them to local companies around our town that had like a front desk counter where there's a lot of people coming in, a lot of traffic mm -hmm. and make sure my business card was on it. I did a lot of things to become very resourceful. So that financial mess up actually helped me so much in my life because at the time it was a nightmare. But then I took the business for $42.86 to a little over $700,000 in nine months because I hustled wow. my butt off recuperate that. But it's not just that I was able to save the company and, you know, make, get some money in the bank. It was because it taught me that I was so much more resourceful and resilient than I ever thought I would be. And mm -hmm. it, it forced me to have a very creative mindset on how to make, how to make things happen with $0. And I still carry that mindset into my companies now, mm -hmm. even if I have the money to fund it or not, I still operate on that flower shop mentality of what can I do to get scrappy and to propel this business with as little cash as I can. Scrappy. I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's an awesome story. And that's probably why you're so successful in the 11 companies that you do own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's, it's just trying to get, you know, getting creative. And I think that's the thing is that a lot of people, people can throw money at something that doesn't mean it's going to work. You have yeah. to be able to have that intrinsic mindset of like, okay, this is how it's going to work. And you have to have the strategy and, when you can become resourceful and resilient, your strategy level, I feel heightens because it's not just what, what can we throw money at to make this work? It's like mm -hmm. building it up. It's a way to strategically build your company to make it healthy and to make it grow. And so you can grow teams, have, you know, provide more jobs yeah. for people. Yeah. Yeah. 
So your your company, one of them, the paper and planning company, will you talk yes. a little bit about your planners that you got? You talked to us about how to go through the week and schedule a week efficiently, really efficiently. Are the items that you have at your company, do they help you do that? Is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, like, I obviously sell weekly and daily planners mm-hmm. um, and I sell a lot of other type of pad, like notepads and things like that. So that will help you organize that priority needs and wants pad, you know, that's something that I created because I used it so often. Yeah. And it's just something that, you know, I, I'm just so passionate about that organization piece just because even when I was just, you know, when I was just working in my office job and I really just had to go to work and back, it helped me though prepare. And I'm just someone that when I'm prepared, I feel more confident about it. You know, I don't think anyone would want to take a meeting and walk into a meeting and not know what's happening, right? That's how I look at my daily life. I look at every day as a meeting and I need to know what's happening so I can be best prepared I can see what's coming up that week. I can see what, you know, what's going on the next week. And, you know, it's it's not as hard as a daunting as people see. I think a lot of people um, look at planning online. They see a bunch of highlighters and stickers and all this kind of stuff. And it doesn't have to be that way. And that's what inspired mm-hmm. me to start the company back in 2020 is I wanted something clean, efficient, and functional. But um, I didn't need a lot of the stuff that's going on in the market. Like I didn't need to talk about what the weather was that day or talk about this or that. I just wanted to like look at something and know I had a game plan. And that's what I use my planner for. It is my game plan for what I'm doing each day. I should check it out because I write everything down on a white legal pad. Oh yeah. And I've got dozens of them and I'm sure yes. that I could be much more organized, but that's what's worked for me. But no, I love it. I'm just, a, I'm a person that writes it down because there's yeah, like there to. so many studies that it's actually, you remember it better. You feel yeah. more accomplished like that. And like, I'm a list mm-hmm. person. I want to write it down, cross it off. And I, you know, I'm just, I'm not a technology person anyway, but I feel like using, this is not a, a dig on anybody that uses it, but like, I just enjoy seeing my planner laid out. I can make simple changes to it. Digital, I just feel like I can't look at all of it. And like, I always think like, what if the internet died tomorrow? All of my stuff would be gone. It would be gone. So that's like how I feel like in the front of my planner, I literally write my, you know, name, phone number, like reward if found because it is like Uh my (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think planning out for the week and all of the to do's. And I also suggest that for folks who are dropping weight to plan out what they're eating for the next day. Absolutely. Rather than thinking in the moment, but plan out exactly what you're going to eat and check it off as you go, which is kind of, you know, you could probably use your planners in that way as well. That's what I have that actually in my plan where we have like, it starts oh, no at 4 way. and at 9 p.m. That's like top five. There's a note section and there's a meet, there's a fitness. So you can track your water. Yeah. You can track if you want to track your fitness or your weight. Then there's mm-hmm. a section on the page for your food. So you can use it for oh, meal awesome. tracking or meal planning. So I do that every week, like just so I know what to grocery shop for. So yeah. I plan out what we're going to eat that week through that. And that's exactly what I do. Like I check it off oh, to make awesome. sure because yeah it's always with me so I can just easily do that instead of going into a million different apps. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Emily, my last question for you is what advice would you give our listeners who are looking to embark on a health transformation and they're juggling, you know, their professional and personal responsibilities? What are the key things? What advice would you give these people to help inspire them? I think it's, you know, it's not as daunting as you think it's going to be. It's mm-hmm. truly just one day at a time. Don't look at it as I have a hundred pounds to lose. Let's say, let me just win this day. Let me eat right. Let me get my steps in. Let me get my fitness in. And you know, th- that those days are going to compound into massive wins for you. You know, we need to quit looking at your, that's like you stand at the base of a mountain and looking up the top, like this is going to take me so long instead of looking at the base of the mountain, standing at the base of the mountain and being like, okay, well, let me just get to this point, you know, and you take those steps to get to that point. Then you can reassess and go the next few steps. So it's really just remembering it's one day at a time, one foot in front of the other, and you know, one smart choice after the next. It's probably how you've built so many successful businesses too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that, I mean, it's really the steps of everything. You know, you yeah. can see the big picture, but it's the little steps that are going to get you to that, you know, the, the quote win, if you will. Yeah, that's great. Well, where can people follow you, learn more about your companies? The easiest way for everything is just at Emily Frisella on Instagram. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Emily, for being here. I really appreciate it. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please leave a review and follow us. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and leave a comment below for me and Emily. I'll make sure that we get back to you. Remember, you've got to step up to make the change. Lead with your heart train your mind and do not negotiate with your body. See you next time.